All right, so this is the exam review for exam three. So let's go through these questions one by one. The first question says the adjacent, adjacent spinner, here's the spinner, is used to play a board game expressing, expressing the answer as a fraction in simplest form. What is the probability that the spinner will land on a number greater than 220? So anybody know how many numbers are greater than 220 here? I think it's three. Is it three? Wait, wait, wait. I just, oh yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I'm seeing three as well. So I see three numbers that are greater than 220. And then what's the total number of possible possibilities, the denominator? So remember- 12. 12. One, two, three, four, five, six on the top, six on the bottom. Yeah. So 12 total possibilities. That, that's always your denominator, the total possible outcomes. And the, your numerator is going to be the, the number of possible um, numbers that are greater than 220, which there are three. But then it says simplest form, right? So Simple. one fourth. One fourth. Yeah. So we do have to reduce, yeah, by three. And you do get one fourth. So let's check the answer key, which I have. And we did get one fourth, yay. So that is correct. I'll just put a check. Cool. So let's move on to the next problem. For an outdoor concert by the city orchestra, concert organizers estimate that 11,000 people will attend if it is not raining. If it is raining, concert organizers estimate that 7,000 people will attend. On, on the day of the concert, meteorologists predict a 30% chance of rain. Determine the expected number. So that's what they want, expected number of people who will attend the concert. So the way you do expected number would be, I'm gonna open up a new, new page. So you have to do, I'd like to do a little table. Okay, so we got rain, no rain. Over here we have number of people that go to the concert and the probability. All right, so if it if it rains, how many people are expected to go? Whoops. If it rains, how many, uh, let's see, 11,000 people will attend if it is not raining. So 11,000 if it's not raining. So right there, 11,000 if it's not raining. And if it is raining, 7,000 people will attend if it is raining. So that would be this one. All right, now we have to figure out the probabilities of each of those happening. The probability, according to the meteorologist, that there that it will rain is thirty percent, right? So that's right. A th so that means point three zero that it will rain. Does anybody know what the probability that it won't rain? Point seven zero. Yeah, very good. Because these two have to add up to a hundred. A hundred percent, right? Perfect. All right, so there it is. Then once you have that, the expected value, the expected number of people would be um, the number of people times the probability plus the number of people times the probability. So let's do that. So 7,000 times the probability plus 11,000 times the probability. That's a formula for expected value. It's the number times the probability plus the number times the probability. So let's see what we get on our calculators. So try that out. I'm getting a grand total of 9,800. So that's your answer. That's the expected number of people that will attend the concert based on the the rain, uh, chances of rain.
All right, so I guess that's how organizers will predict approximately how many people will show up. So 9,800. All right, let's look at the next one. In a proposed business venture, a businesswoman estimates that there is a 70% chance that she will make $53,000 and a 30% chance that she will lose $68,000. Find her expected value. So it's the same setup. This time it, it involves money. So let's open up another slide. And let's create another table. All right, so she's either gonna win money or lose money, right? <clears throat> she will make or lose. So I'll just say make or lose. And then the amount that she's gonna make or lose and the probability. All right, so let's see how much she's going to make. If she, if she, <clears throat> she will make the, uh, what's the chance? There's a 70% chance she will make 53,000. So 73% chance amount would be 53,000. And there is a 70% chance that that happens. And then she will lose 30% chance that she will lose 68,000. 30% chance. And then anybody know what goes here? Sixty-eight thousand. Sixty-eight thousand. Yeah, but what do we have to do to that if it's a loss? It's going to be a negative sixty-eight thousand. So you're going to subtract. Yeah, it's going to be a negative, which means you're going to have to subtract. So whenever you, whenever the problem involves winning or losing money, just forget. Don't forget that losing means negative. So the expected amount of money that she would make or lose would be fifty-three thousand times 0.70 minus um, 68,000 times 0.30. So let's see what that turns out to be. I am getting 16,700, anybody get that? All right, so that is what I'm getting. I'm getting a positive number. That means she's actually gonna, on average, she would make money instead of lose money on average. So she would make on average $16,700. All right, so that, so that, yeah, go ahead. All right, next problem says, to use an automated teller machine at a certain bank, you must enter a six digit code. Using the digits one through nine, how many six digit codes are possible if repetition of digits is permitted? So you're allowed to repeat the digits. There are 10 digits, right? Oh no, sorry, nine digits, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine digits. Okay, all right, so let's do that. And there's a six digit code. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. For the first digit, you have nine possibilities. Second digit, because there are repeats are permitted, that means you also have nine possibilities. For all of them, you have nine possibilities. And then of course you multiply that's a counting principle, tells us that we're, we should multiply. That's gonna be nine to the sixth power, whatever that is. So on your calculators, do nine exponent six, and you should get uh, 531,441. So that's how many possibilities are possible um, six digit codes there are.
<laughs> All right. Let's move right along. License plates in a particular state are, are to consist of two digits followed by two uppercase letters. All right, so two digits followed by two uppercase letters. The first question says, first part says, how many different license plates can there be in the state if repetition of letters and numbers is permitted? All right. All right, so let's see. Let's check our answers. We forgot to check our answers for all these problems. Number two, let's check this one. Yep, we got that one right. Number three. Let's see if we got that one right. 16,700. Yep. Number four, I think we got that right too. 531,400. 441. Yep, we got that one right. All right, the next one. All right, so it says repetition and letters is permitted. So they're saying two digits, but I think we're supposed to assume that zero counts. So zero, one, zero through nine, which means there's 10 digits possible instead of nine digits possible. So there's 10. So you're going to have one, two, three, four. For the digits, there's 10 possibilities if you include zero, so 10. And for the uppercase letters, there's 26 letters in the alphabet, so there's 20, 26 possibilities. All right, so for the first two, it's digits, so 10 times 10, because we're allowed to repeat. And then for the second one, the two last ones are 26, 26. So it's going to be 10 squared times 26 squared. Let's see what that is. I'm getting 67,600. All right. All right, so let's check our answer. Yeah, we got it right. All right, for the second part, it says there are blank different possible license plates if repetition of the numbers is not permitted. So not permitted. So same scenario, except, um, let's see, one, two, oops. So for the first choice or for the first digit, there's 10 possibilities, but since you can't repeat, how many possibilities are there for the second digit? Just nine this time, because you can't use the one that you used in the first, in the first digit, for the first digit. And then for the second two, there's 26 letters you can choose from. And then since you can't repeat, now you only have 25 to choose from. So that's gonna be the answer. 10 times 9 times 26 times 25, which is 58,500. And let's check our answer. Yes, it is correct. All right, so that's how you would do that one. All right, the third, the third part says there are blank different possible license plates if the first and second digits must be even and repetition of the letters and numbers is not permitted. All right, so the first and second digits must be even this time. <coughs> okay, so how many even digits are there between zero and 10? I'm sorry, zero and nine. So zero, two, four, six, eight. One, two, three, four, five. So there's five even digits. So there's five digits that are even and repetition is not permitted. So that means that now we only have four digits to choose from. 
All right, and then for the letters, there's no restrictions, 26 letters, but you can't repeat, so 25. All right, so let's do it now. Five times four times 26 times 25 is, I'm getting 13,000. Let's see if that's correct. It is. All right. It's a good feeling when you get it right. All right. There are blank different possible license plates. If the first digit cannot be six and repetition of letters and numbers is not permitted, cannot be six. See that one. All right, so the first one cannot be six. There's 10 possibilities, but if you remove six, now there's only nine possibilities. Um, repetition is not permitted. So um, let's see. So now you can choose six again, right? Now you're allowed to choose six, but you can't choose the number that you chose first. So instead of having 10 possibilities, now there's only nine possibilities. So once again, that's because you are allowed to choose six, but you're not allowed to choose the one that you chose over here because you, you're not allowed to repeat. So now there's nine possibilities for the second number. And there's going to be 26 letters and then followed by 25 so, since you can't repeat letters either. So that's going to be getting 52,650. Let's see if that one's right. Yeah, that's right. Good. You got it right. All right, so that's how you do the license plate um, problem. So let's keep it moving. Number six, if you have any questions, feel free to just, you know, ask them. If a club consists of 12 members, how many different arrangements of president, vice president, and secretary are possible? So does anybody remember if this is going to be a combination or a permutation? Does it order matter or does it not matter? It, it matters. It matters, which means it's going to be a? Permutation. Yeah, permutation is correct. All right, so our N is gonna be the number of members, which is 12. Our, our R is gonna be the number of positions that we need. We need three positions, so. 12P3. All right, so I'll show you um, how to do it on your calculator. But if you don't have a graphing calculator, then you can do it on your, um, you can do it by hand. So let's do it both ways. So first the calculator way, let me show you how to do that. Um, turn on my calculator. And show I got one. Though. You already got it? Yeah. First number, the M, which is 12. Then you go to stat. Oh no, I'm sorry, that's that, you go to math. And then you go to uh, P-R-O-B, probability. So you, you go to the right, and then it's gonna be the second one. And then it's gonna be three, 12 P three, enter. And there it is, you're right, 13, 20. That's the answer. Let's say you don't have a calculator with that function, then you could still all right, so the formula is n factorial over n minus r factorial. That's it. So that's going to be 12 factorial divided by 9 factorial. Remember the trick I showed you? You just you just um, go down to the until you reach the, that bottom number. So you're going to go. 12 times 11 times 10 times 9, and then you can stop and then just put the factorial over 9 factorial, and then you can cancel out the 9 factorials. So your answer is just going to be 10 times 11 times 10, which is 1320, which is exactly what we got over here. So it's the same answer. So let's check our answer. And it is right. All right, let's keep going. All right, number seven. 
In a race in which 10 automobiles are entered and there are no ties, in how many ways can the first three finishers come in? So the first three finishers, you just write one, two, three. So we'll call this first place, second place, third place. So how many, how many possibilities are there for first place? There are 10. 10 yeah, there's 10 different cars that can be first. And then how many choices are there for second place? Nine. Yeah, nine, because the first place winner is out. So now there's only nine people to choose, nine cars to choose from. And now for third place, there's only eight. eight. And we multiply, and that should be 720. 720. Let's see if we're right. And we are. All right. You could have also done um, NPR because it's there's three three finishers for a second place, for a second, third. And so that would have been 10 automobiles, P3. And you would get the same thing. <clears throat> so there's a couple ways to think about it. All right, in how many distinct ways can the letters of fallacy be arranged? So this is one of those problems where you have to count the number of letters. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven letters. So it'd be seven factorial. But then you have to divide the ones that are that are repeating letters. So the L repeats twice. So that's two factorial. And then the A repeats twice. That's two factorial again. Any other repeats? No. No, no that's it. So you only divide by the, the repeating letters. So L twice and A twice, and that's it. So let's work this out. Seven factorial is, so to do that on your calculator, you could just do you can just do this. I'll show you how to do it on the calculator. Just put the parentheses on the bottom. You could just do this on the calculator. So you would go to seven factorial. You go back to math. And then you go back to P-R-O-B, probability. And then it's the fourth one, the factorial symbol. Divided by, you do need parentheses because you have two numbers in the bottom, two factorial, two back to math, back to P-R-O-B, back to number four, times two factorial again, back to math, back to P-R-O-B, number four, close parentheses, and that's going to do it. It's going to be 1260. And of course, you can also do it by hand. Yeah, so I think we got, we got, what was it, 1260? Yeah, 1260 was our answer. So you could do seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, <coughs> over two, one, two, one. You can cancel out the two ones. And then you see that two goes into four twice. So now you have seven times six times five times two times three, and you should get 1260. So that's how you would do it without the calculator function. All right, same thing for the next one. Let's look at the next one, it says, and how many ways can the digits and the numbers be arranged? So it's exactly the same style of problem, except instead of letters, it's numbers. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven digits again, divided by the repeats. Anybody see any repeats? Nine, four. Uh, nine repeats, one, two, three, four times. So you have to divide by four factorial and the uh, Four repeats just twice, right? Twice. And that's, so you can do it the same way we did this one on the calculator, or you can just do it the way I did it before. Seven, six, five, four factorial. I'm going to stop at four factorial because I see a four factorial there that I can cancel. And then I still have to write out the, the two factorial. 
So the four factorials cancel, and then two goes into six three times. So the answer is going to be seven times three times five. I got 105. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I got 105 too. 105. So that's how many different ways you can arrange these digits in any order. All right, so we got to check these two. I don't think we checked those. So eight and nine. Eight, nine. Yeah, we got those. That one's right. That one's right. All right, we got a few more to go. So you know, nice. Yeah. It's, not, it's not writing anymore. Oh, yeah, it disconnected. Let me see if I can get it to connect again. I just checked the answers eight and nine, and it looks like we we got those right. Okay, we are number 10. <clears throat> An ice cream store sells 29 flavors of ice cream. Determine the number of seven dip Sundays. How many seven dip Sundays are possible if order is not considered and no flavor is repeated? Okay, so let's see. That means there's no order, like order is not important. So that's a C problem, right? Since the order is not important. So we have 29 to choose from. And we're choosing seven of them, seven flavors. All right, so on your calculators, we can first find the answer by using our calculators. So let's do that first. So remember, first enter the number 29 on your calculator, then go to math, PRB, go down to number three, which is NCR, and then type seven. And I'm getting, anybody get a number? 1,560,000. One million, oh, yeah, you got it, that is right. So that's what I'm getting. Let me just check if it's correct. Yeah, that's what they got too. All right, that's good. All right, if you don't have the calculator function, then you would do the formula, which is n factorial divided by n minus r factorial divided by seven r factorial. So the difference between the C and the P the C has this extra R factorial on the bottom. All right, so first subtract 29 take away seven is 22. So that's gonna be 29, I'm gonna do this on a separate sheet. So it's gonna be 29 factorial divided by 22 factorial divided by seven factorial, right? So 29 take away seven is 22. So that's where I got the 22 from. So my trick is to stop at 22 so I can cancel. So 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22 factorial stop. 22 factorial and then seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And at least we can cancel the 22 factorials out. Let's see, what else can we do? Seven goes into 28 four times, six goes into 24 four times. The five goes into 25 five times. Yeah, five goes into 25 five times. Three goes into uh, 27 nine times. And then finally two goes into 26. I thought the four went into 26. Uh, four, oh yeah, four goes into 22. Um, well, I think I, I forgot what I canceled the four out. I canceled the four out with the other four, this four with this four. Um, I the thought three, the six one is nice. Um, yeah, the six goes into that four times, and then the four cancels with the four. Um, uh. so this, yeah, so let's multiply the numbers that are remaining to see if we get the same answer. So 29, 4, 9, 13, 5, and 
Yeah, I'm getting the same thing. Yep, I got the same answer. All right, perfect. Yeah. So there it is. You get the same answer. But obviously, it's much faster to do this on a calculator. If you have a graphic calculator, you can do NCR. All right, let's look at number 11. A doctor has two doses of flu protection vaccine left. He has six women and nine men who want the medication. If the names of these two people are selected at random, determine the probability that two men's names are selected. All right, the problem is done without replacement. So you can't replace the person back into the, the hat. Um, so let's see, use combinations. All right, first let's figure out the, the denominator because this is a probability problem. Determine the probability. So the denominator is going to be... 11. It's going to be, well, you have um, how many total people to choose from? Sorry, I'm looking at that wrong. 15. Yeah, 15. and. Um, how many people are we selecting? Two. Two. So it's 15 choose two. So out of the 15, we're choosing two people. So that means that's your denominator. All right. And then the numerator is going to be, um, it says, determine the probability that two men are selected. So there's nine men total, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be nine choose two. Two. Yeah, nine choose two, because there's nine men and you're selecting two of them. So that's the numerator. So now we have to do this on our calculator. Um, all right, so let's look up the calculator. Uh, first, let's do nine choose two on the calculator. So 36. Got 36. Okay, perfect. Yeah, 36. And the den uh, denominator, 15 choose 2, is? 105. Okay, 105. And then it says they want it in simplest form, simplified fraction. So I think we can divide by um, 3. I know we can divide by 3. So that would be 12 over 35. 35. And then we can... Uh, can we simplify more? Or I think that's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So that is it. 12 out of 35 is a probability. So this one's a little bit harder because you had to, whenever you see the word probability, you need a fraction. And the denominator is all the possible possibilities. In this case, there's 15 total people and you're choosing two. In the numerator, they say, what's the probability that two men are selected? There's only nine men, so nine choose two is your numerator. All right, so let's see if we got that one right. Professor, so whatever you see probability, that automatically, that's a fraction. Yeah, that's the key word, exactly right. So if you see the word probability, then you always want to create a fraction. And then I always start with the denominator because okay. I always like to find the total number of possible, possible choices. And in this case, it was 15 choose two. And then I... I I, try, I do the numerator, depending on what they're asking for. So let's see if it's right. 11. Yeah, we got it. Hey, all right. All right, we're almost done. So let's keep, do you guys want to take a break or just keep going? Keep going. Because we only have up to 17 problems. So, I mean, if you guys feel like you need a break, just let me know. We can stop and take a break. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'll just continue. So it says, um, 12, identify the sampling technique used to obtain the following sample. A group of people are classified according to race, and then random samples of people from each group are taken. So which one is the type of sampling that is being used if you're classifying according to race, and then random samples of each group? Remember when you break it into categories, it's one of these two. There's stratified and there's cluster. In this case, we're breaking it up in, by race and then we're just selecting this, so, and then we're selecting a sample from each race. <clears throat> so in that case, I don't know if you remember, but the definition was stratified for that. 
cluster is when you break it break it up. Let's say you break it up into race, and then you select everybody in. Maybe you have, I don't know, white, black, Hispanic, Asian. Let's just say you had those, and then you have a sample in each. So cluster is when you take everybody here, everybody here, for example, that would have been cluster. But stratified is when you take, maybe you take three of these, three of these, three of these, three of these. So you take a small sample from each group. So that's stratified. So in this case, it is stratified. All right, the next one says, Identify the sampling technique used in the following. A state is divided into regions using area codes. A random sample. So the same thing, they're breaking it up into area codes. Maybe this is the two, one, threes, three, two, threes, five, six, twos. What else is a popular one? Three, one, oh's? Yeah. All right. And then they're taking, they say, they're taking a sample of 30 area codes. So they're taking everybody here, everybody here, and there's a whole lot more, but I'm just, I just have a small sample. So that would be cluster because sure. we're taking everybody in these subgroups. And so that's why it's called this cluster. There we go. All right. The next one. Um, Identify the sampling technique. Every 13th person in line to buy tickets is asked to his or her age. So anybody remember what that one's called when you take the every nth person? Maybe, um... Systematic? Yeah, you got it. That's right. It's called systematic when you take the like every third person or every fifth person or every 13th. That's systematic. All right. So number 15. All right. Use a frequency distribution to determine the total number of observations. So to find the total number of observations, you just add up the frequencies. So let's find the sum of all these. So thirty-seven. Yeah, I'm getting thirty-seven. Yeah, <clears throat> thirty-seven. It is. All right. The width of each class. Does anybody remember how to find the width? Um, the width was was that when you take the what's it the take away the, the high point? I'm on the right track. I know what it is, but I can't. Don't you subtract the high point from the low point? Yeah, I think yeah. You, you subtract these two. Um, yeah, the lower oh, class yeah. limits, yeah. consecutive lower class limits. So if you subtract 16, take away nine. That's going to be it. 16 take away nine is seven, right? Okay. Yeah. And then the midpoint, anybody remember how to find the midpoint of the second class? So here's the class that we're looking at the midpoint for. You would add the two numbers and then divide by two. 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 Yeah. So that's going to be 38 divided by 2. I think it's 6. 19. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 19. Yeah, 19. Thanks. So 19 it is. All right. The modal class or classes is or are. So the modal class is when you have the, the class that has the highest frequency. Anybody know which class has the highest frequency? There could be more than 22 one. 22 and 37 and 42. Yeah, so there's two modal classes. 
because they these two have the high, uh, highest frequencies and it says separate use a comma to separate them so the first one would be 16 to 22 and the second one we said is 37 through 43. all right the class limits of the next class if an additional class were to be added you have to figure out what the next class's limits would be if there was not another one how would you get this lower bound add seven add, um... yeah you add the class width so good if you add seven you're gonna get 51 and then same thing over here you add seven 57, 57. All right, let's check our answers. It should be 37, 7, 19, these two classes, and 51 through 57. Let's check. So correct, 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 I think. Let's see. Yep, and then 16, 22, 37, 43. Yep, and then 51 through 57. So it looks like we got that all right. All right, there's only two more problems to go, so we might as well just finish up and, and then we can finish class early today. So using the following values, find the mean, median, and mode, and mid-range. So let's start with the mean. Anybody remember how to find the mean? Well, you have to add up all the numbers. Isn't all the numbers added up and then you divide it by the total number? Yeah, exactly. And I think there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's seven numbers. So you divide by seven. Okay. That's, yeah, I'm getting 321 divided by seven. Anybody get 45.857? Yes. All right, so let's round to the nearest 10. So 45.857, the nearest 10th would be this place. So that's going to bump that up to a nine, right? 45.9. Yes. All right, the median. So in order to find the median, do you guys remember how to do that? We have Put the numbers in numerical that. order? Yeah. Yeah. Smallest to largest. So the smallest is 32, then 40. So the median is 45. Okay, 43, I think, is the next. 45, 52, 53, 56. All right, and then the middle would be. Looks like that's the middle, right? Because you have one, two, three to the left, one, two, three to the right. So yes, 45 is the median. All right, select the correct choice below and fill in. Okay, so what is the mode? Anybody see a mode? Or is there no or is there none? No, it's, that's a if it's a repeat, right? Yeah, if there's a repeat. But... Yeah, there's no mode. Okay. So that would be, there is no mode. No. And then the last question is the mid range. So the mid range is, here's the formula. It's the max minus the min, that's it. So the max minus the min, oh wait, actually it's, is it divided by two, the mid range? Actually, I think it's, I think you add them and divide by two, sorry. It's like finding a midpoint. So it's the same thing as find, finding the midpoint. So you add the largest and the smallest and divide by two. So it's gonna be 56 plus 32 divided by two. Which is? Anybody get 44? All right, so let's see if we got these right. So 45.9, 45, no mode, 44. Yes. 
So yes, 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 yes. Okay, good. I almost forgot the formula for mid-range. So yeah, just make sure you guys have this handy. The mid-range formula is max plus min divided by two. All right, and we have one final question. Um, what do you guys think of this so far? You guys think you guys can do well on this exam? I think it'll be okay. Yeah, I think you guys should be okay. It's not as hard as number two. Exam two was hard, right? Yeah. This one's a little bit better. So let's see. All right, find the range and the standard deviation. So first let's find the range. So see how it didn't say mid-range, it just says range. So when it says range, that's when you do the max minus the min. That's what the that's what I was confusing the mid-range with. So what's the max? 304. It's already in order for us. And the min is 280. So the range is 24. All right, standard deviation. Oh man, this one's a little bit more work. So let's see if we can find the formula for standard deviation. I think it was in section 12.4. If you look at your 12.4 um, homework, I mean uh, notes, standard deviation is given to you here. So remember what we did, we created the table and we did the data, data minus mean, data minus mean squared, and then we added this and then that's how we, so I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna copy this formula. So what we need is we need, all right, I'm gonna do the data. Data minus mean. Data minus mean squared. Okay, so the data is 280, 284. 288, 292, 296, 300, 304. All right, so first thing we need is the mean. So we have to add them all up and divide by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So let's do that first, the mean. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so let's see what the mean is first. I got, uh, I hope it's right, 297. Let's see, I'm getting. But when we added up, it was. Um, 2004 divided by seven's 292. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. All right, good. Looks like we both got the same thing. Hopefully the rest of you guys got something, uh, the same number. All right, so we got 292 for the mean, and now we have to do each data value minus the mean, each data value minus the mean. So we have to do a lot of subtractions. So 280 minus 292, that's gonna be a negative, 12. All right, 284, take away 292. That's going to be 8, negative 8. Yeah. 288, take away 292. That's going to be a negative 4. And then 292 minus 292, that's 0. Yeah. 296 minus 292 
is four, positive four. 300, take away 292 is positive uh, eight. And then the last one is 304, take away 292 is 12, positive 12. All right, and then the last column, you just have, you have to square all these numbers, square them. It doesn't matter if they're negative because whenever you square a negative, it becomes positive. So what, 12 squared is 144, eight squared is 64, four squared 16, zero squared is zero, 16, 64, 144. And then the last thing we do is we add these up. So see how the formula says they want the sum of the square. So we have to add up, the sum is adding up all these numbers. So let's find the sum. So it's gonna be. 448. Yeah, I'm getting 448. All right, so that's what the formula says. So standard deviation is equal to the square root of <clears throat> 448 divided by n minus one. Well, n is seven because there's seven data values. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven take away one is six. So on your calculators, do the square root of 448 divided by six equals, and you should get, does it tell us how many decimals they want? They say round to the nearest hundredth. So that means two decimal places. So I'm getting 8.640, zero, but zero is gonna keep that at four. So that should do it. That should be the standard deviation, 8.64, Let's see if we got it right. Mr. Nales? Right. Yes. Can you show us how to do it on the calculator, the square root? Yeah, yeah, let me show you that. Um, 24, let's check that one. Yeah, we got that one right. I wonder why there's a number 18, but there's no number 18 here. Oh, there is an 18. <laughs> okay, so here it is. Um, calculator. Let me just get the charger because my, my tablet's going to die in, in like a couple minutes. So let me just get my, my charger real fast. We do this on the calculator is, all right, so we got, this is what we're going to enter into the calculator. Square root of 448 divided by six. So let's do that now. All right, so the way you get the, the square root button is you go to the second, the blue button that says second, second, and where it says x squared, there's a little square root symbol right above. So that's how you get the square root symbol. So second x squared, and it gives you the square root. Then you do 448 divided by six. And then it should be completely under the square root. Everything should be under the square root symbol. And then enter. And that's how we got 8.64. They only want two decimal. They say the hundredth place, so the hundredth place is the second decimal place. So right at the four, 8.64 is our final answer. All right, so now we just got one final problem to go. So that's right. So the final problem looks like this. It says, assume that the mathematics scores on, an, on the SAT are normally distributed. So normally distributed, that means a bell-shaped curve. All right, so here's the bell-shaped curve. With a mean of 500, so the mean goes in the middle. And a standard deviation of 100. What percent of students who took the SAT um, scored below 590? So 590 would be somewhere to the right. 500 is in the middle so 590 is about right there somewhere and it says below so that means we need a shade to the left 
because that's all the scores that are below 590 are over here. All right. So if you have a graphing calculator, then you don't have to do much. All you have to do is go to, I'll show you how to do it, but you would go to second bars normal CDF, your lower value, your upper value, your mean, and your standard deviation. All right, so let's step, let's go through those steps on the calculator. And then I'll show you how to do it if you don't have a graphing calculator. So if you do have a calculator, so here's the second button, the blue one. VARS is right here. And then you go to normal CDF, which is number two. And it's going to ask you for the lower. The lower is, well, if you look at the graph, the part that we shaded is all the way to the left. All the way to the left, we always put a super small number or a super big number, but negative. Nine, 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 nine is what I like to do. And then the upper is going to be 590 is the highest score that we're looking for. And then your mean is 500 was the mean. And then the standard deviation was 100. Paste. All right. How did you get negative 9999? Oh, how did, okay. you, how did you put the negative in? Oh, the negative is this button. See this negative right here, where it says at the very bottom. You don't have to press anything else but that button, right? Yeah, just that button. Oh, um, okay. So, let me show you how to why it's negative nine 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 nine. So it's point eight. Well, how many decimal places do they want? Percent round to two decimals. So it's going to be eighty one point fifty nine percent. Eighty one point fifty nine percent. So let's write that. So it's going to be 81.59%. So this is your lower, your lower value is all the way to the left. So that's going to be negative 9999. Mm -hmm. Your upper value, it only goes this high. So that's 590 is the upper value. The mean is given to us 500. Oops. The mean is 500, and then the standard deviation is also given to you at 100. So that's how you would do it with the calculator. Let's say you don't have a calculator. Um, so what? remember the formula that we need to use? The formula looks like this. I'll write it right here. The formula is Z equals data minus mean over standard deviation. So we have to uh, convert this score into a z-score. So 590 is your x, your mean is 500, and your standard deviation is 100. So that's going to be 90 over 100, which is 0.9. And yeah, 90 over 100 is 0.9. Is yeah, so once you have the z-score, you can redraw your distribution all over again. Oops. Your mean becomes zero. Your standard deviation becomes one. And the z-score is 0.9. So 0.9 is still over here somewhere. Point 0.9. All right, then you use the table that's given to you right here. So 0.9, oh, they don't give you the positive values. Oh man, that's done. Uh, let's see, oh, here they are. If you go to the next page, 0.9 is right there and you want zero, zero. So there it is. Point eight. One five nine. That's exactly what we got on the calculator. Remember, point eight five nine point eight one.
0.8159, but then they want percent. So that means you move the decimal two spaces to the right. One, two, 81.59 percent. So let's look at the answer key, make sure we got that right. And we did. All right, that is Professor, it. Professor, if you have the 83, um, you just put all the lower, upper, and the mean within the parentheses and you close it. You yeah, exactly right. That is right. Um, I forgot to mention that some calculators, if you have a TI-83, you'll have uh -huh. to go normal CDF, and then it'll, it'll automatically be, give you the parentheses uh -huh. And then you just have to put the lower number, uh -huh. the comma, upper number, comma, mean, comma, standard deviation, close parentheses, yeah. And then press enter. Yeah, and then you would push enter. Okay. Oops, enter. <laughs> and that would do it, yes. Okay. So, hopefully you guys, uh, if you guys study the study guide, I think you'll be okay for the actual exam because it's I just get the problems that are similar to these. So yeah. it should be very similar to the study guide, but just shorter. It'll be shorter. So you know, you know it's not gonna be 18 questions long. It'll probably be like 10. Okay. All right. And remember you have until Sunday to do that. So you don't really have to check into class on Wednesday because it's a test day. So you don't really have to check into class. You can just go you can just if you choose to take it on Wednesday, you can take it during our class time. But if you don't want to take it during our class time, you don't really have to come to class on Wednesday because you're just taking the test. All right, so that 